In the first part we stopped at the fourth degree of the burn. Maybe here it will be see better than uh, fourth degree of the burn involved all uh, layers of the tissue. It involves all layers of the skin, subcutaneous fat, muscles and even bones. First bite. Another thermal uh, injury. So frostbite occurs when exposure to low temperature causes freezing of the skin or other tissues. Severity of the frostbite depends on temperature and duration. Pathogenesis of the frostbite is very easy to remember. We have exposure of the cold, which leads to vasoconstriction. And if vasoconstriction is uh, um, long enough, we have thrombosis of our vessels, which can lead to the gangrene. We have three degrees of the frostbite. Um, by severity, mild, it's redness or frosty, moderate. We have bullas, like the second degree of the uh, burn, and severe can lead to the gangrene. Treatment revamp not only the frozen area, but the whole body. It means uh, we can reform person in the case we deal with first aid. If we try to treat this person with gangrene, uh, we must amputate uh, the limb or delete the necrotic parts of the skin, subcutaneous fat and maybe sometimes even muscles and bones. Uh, if you compare frostbite with uh, burn, you must remember one thing, that when you compare these things, you cannot understand which degree of the frostbite you have when you see patient at first, because after some person have exposure to the cold, he can have some redness on their hands or maybe on their foot. But you cannot understand what the degree it's exactly. If you wait for one day or two days and look at this person, you can see the bullets of gangrene after a while. So here we see the picture of the stages or degrees of the frostbite. First stage, first, first nip, pins and needles sensation, skin turns very white and soft. Stage 2. Superficial frostbite. Match of blistering, skin is numb, waxy and frozen, ice crystal foam in the skin. Stage 3. Deep frostbite. Freezing of blood vessels, muscles, tendons and nerves and bones can lead to permanent damage, blood clots, gangrene, no feeling in the affected area due to the damage to the nerves, usually no blistering, Serious infection and loss of limb is frequent. Medical attention is needed as soon as possible. And here we see picture of the damage. So, if we compare with the burn, here we have no damage. In the frost nip, it's the upper layers of the epidermis. Uh, in the superficial frostbite, we have uh, our damage to the derma. And you must remember the layers of the skin. Because in the uh, deep dermal layer, papillary layer, if I remember um, right enough, we have vessels. And if this vessels is damaged, so our blisters is become red or bluish because blood fills uh, these blisters. And we and if we see yellowish color of the blisters, it means that our damage or injury don't go deep enough to damage the 
vessels. And if we talk about deep frostbite, epidermis, dermis and subcutaneous fish, uh, tissue, maybe uh, even muscles and bones are damaged. Chemical wounds. Chemical wounds made by alkali or base uh, lead to collocative necrosis. Necrotic tissue becomes liquefied, silent protein enzymatic lysis. Swelled base lead to pain, salivation and vomiting. Aspiration of base uh, lead to laryngospasm, edema, serous esophagus injury. Mucosal layer of stomach becomes gelatinous perforation. Uh, it can lead to perforation, and it can dissolve protein. And acid wound. In small concentration, it's only irritate. In large concentration, coagulation, coagulative necrosis. Swollen so acid, called chest pain, vomiting, aspiration of acid called laryngospasm and edema to like the base. It can lead to stomach injury, perforation, shock, peritonitis, absorbed acid, uh, lead to acidosis, respiratory disorder, coma and renal failure. Classification of wound by time. Acute. An acute wound is an injury to the skin that occurs Suddenly, rather than over time, it heals at a predictable and expected rate according to the normal wound healing process. Chronic. A chronic wound develops when any acute wound fails to heal in the expected time frame for that type of wound, which might be a couple of weeks or up. Example, gratia ulcer, decubitus or burn wound. So acute. This is the type if somebody was stabbed by a knife and chronic it's wound with bad healing like a decubitus due to the lack of the blood supply classification of the wound according to the bacterial contamination we have four types First one, it's clean wound. In operation, we have no contamination because we use rules of aseptics and antiseptics. Clean contaminated wound. Infected clean wound, respiratory GI tract urogenital system is open under aseptic condition in operative theater. In this time, uh, it can be um, you need antibiotic prophylaxis for this patient. Contaminated wound. Septic operation, the microorganism involved in the infection was in the operation site before the operation. Acute or accidental wounds, perforation, fistula and abscesses. You must need, um, you need to use antiseptics and anti antibiotic prophylaxis in these cases, always and heavily contaminated wound, severe septic operation, long time between the contamination and the wound care, example gradia wall wounds, gangrene, abscess, ileus, tissue necrosis and organ necrosis. You must use antiseptic and antibiotics always and even not one antibiotic and several types of antibiotics at once. Phases of healing process. We have three major phases. First is hemostasis and inflammation, second proliferation, and then goes epithelization, which leads to scar. In the first phase, hemostasis and inflammation. Hemostasis precedes and initiates inflammation with the ensuring release of hematectic factors from the wound site, wounding by definition disrupt tissue integrity, leading to division of blood vessels and direct exposure of extracellular matrix to platelets. Exposure of some subanthocellular collagen platelets result in platelet aggregation, degranulation and activation of the coagulation cascade. First of all, when some patients have wound, uh, 
his vessels become constricted. And then we have coagulation. It's uh, first phase of wound healing. Second phase is prol proliferation. The proliferative phase is the second phase of wound healing and roughly spans days 4 through 12. It is during this phase that tissue continuity is re-established and the endothelial cells proliferate extensively during this phase of healing. If you look uh, to this skull, you have so-called granulation tissue. What does it mean? Uh, when you see that uh, you take off the gauze from the wound and you see mesh pattern or uh, pattern like mm, you saw tissue looks like a watermelon, it means you, you look at the granulation tissue. It means the uh, second phase of the wound healing. And the third phase and the last epithelization. While tissue integrity and strength are being re-established, the external barrier must also be restored. This process is characterized primarily by proliferation and migration of epithelial cells adjacent to the wound. The process being within one day of injury and is seen as thickening of the epidermis at the wound age. Marginal basal cells at the edge of the wound lose their firm attachment to the underlying dermis, enlarge and begin to migra migrate across the surface of the proximal matrix. Fixed basal cells in zone near the cottage undergo a series of rapid metodic divisions and these cells appear to migrate by moving over one another in a leapfrog fashion until the defect is covered. Here we see example of epithelization. So we have direct injury from some object and here around we have tissue with less severe injury, less severe in, uh, than in the epicenter, but these uh, parts of the wound is necrotized and eaten by macrophages, macrophage, sorry, here and here we see that the wound become wider and then it healed, like here. You must understand some stages of the wound is go simultaneously. So first of all we have coagulation with a constriction, but our vessels cannot be constricted all the time. They must relax so uh, muscle of the vessels um, become dilated. Second phase uh, in the second turn we have inflammation and where we have inflammation we have neutrophils, macrophage and then uh, fibroblast go to the wound and we have uh, epithelization then contraction and angiogenesis and maturation and remodeling that can still be in a couple of years. Classification of wound closure. Healing by primary intention. All layers are closed. The incision that heals by first intention does so in a minimum amount of time, with no separation of the wound ages and with minimal scar formation. Healing by second orientation. Deep layers are closed by superficial layers, are left to heal from the inside out. Healing by second is appropriate in case of infection, excessive trauma, tissue loss or imprecise approximation of tissue. Healing by tertiary intention also referred to as divide primary closure. Uh, healing by tertiary intention uh, can be example when we have um, abscess of the uh, subcutaneous tissue, we made incision, uh, we put drain and after uh, a week when the, our wound is granulated and no, inf uh, no infected anymore we 
made some sutures to approximate the wound edges. And so here we have healing by tertiary intention and it will be a primary closure. So here we see primary intention scar. Uh, this is cat gut you saw here. So this is will be mild and uh, not obvious scar. And here we see the example. So comparing secondary intention healing. Maybe here we have a wound site infection or surgical wound infection. That is why secondary intention healing is made so bad cosmetic result. So surgical wound infection. The incision or infections identified by purulent or cultural positive drainage is isolated from any structure about the fascia in approximately in a proximity to the initial wound. Deep infections are char characterized by purulent drainage from subfascial drains, wound dehiscence or abscess formation and involve adjacent sites manipulated during surgery. Wound dehiscence, breakdown of the surgical wound. Patient related factors for surgery wound infection. Age, more than 60 years, female, obesity, presence of remote infection, underlying disease status, diabetes, congestive head, heart failure, liver disease, renal failure, duration of preoperative stay hospitalization, more than 72 hours, or staying in the intensive care unit, immune suppression, and uh, high score, it means 3, 4 or 5 by the physical assessment of American Society of Anesthesiologists. We talk about this uh, in the nine lecture. So we have surgery wound uh, uh, infection related factors. Magnitude of tissue trauma and devitalization, blood loss and hematoma, wound classification, potential bacterial contamination, presence of drains, pegs and grapes can be a source uh, or channel to infection into the deep wounds or some cavities. Ischemia, wound leakage, merging surgery, duration of surgery more than 60 or 120 minutes, so hour or two, previous surgery, timing of antibiotic administration, placement of foreign body, hip knee replacement, heart valve insertion, shunt insertion, hypotension, hypoxia, dehydration and hypothermia. Surgery related factors, patient preparation, shaving the operating site, preparation of operating site, draping the patient, surgery preparation, hand washing and skin acceptance and gloving. In any of these stages we can make some mistake which can lead to surgery wound infection. Wound related factors magnitude of tissue trauma and devitalization, blood loss and hematoma, wound classification, some wound have uh, more strict evidence to be infected uh, like puncture wound because in the deep layers of the tissue we have um, high containing of the infection potential bacterial contamination presence of drains, pecs and drapes as I say earlier ischemia and wound leakage so when we have um, talk about how we must uh, make first aid, make sorry, make first aid. We must stop bleeding and uh, 
give our patient some painkillers. If we don't um, on our work, we must stop bleeding as we can. If this is arterial bleeding, we must use tourniquet. If this is uh, venous bleeding, we must use uh, stereo gauss to make dressing and uh, pressure dressing to stop or uh, swallow, swallow the venous bleeding. And if we have capillary bleeding, we must access some uh, gauze to the wound and make dressing. And that's all. We can uh, slightly up if we can uh, foods of the patient and slightly uh, turn down head uh, of the patient. Hemostasis. We have two main parts of the hemostasis, temporary and final. Temporary it uh, reviewed to the first aid and final made in the hospital. So temp temporary hemostasis, elevated position of the limb, uh, applying a pressure bandage, if we have venous bleeding, finger pressure of the artery in the wound, maximum flexion of the limb, applying a hemostatic clamp, applying an esmerf tourniquet, tamponade or use hemostop. Hemostop is a military technology, it's a chemical compound which contains uh, hitin. Uh, if we add it to the wound, in it um, become gross in the volume and it tamponades the wound. You can watch more materials about hemostop on YouTube if you search so. Final hemostasis. It divides on four types. It, 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 uh, it's just a review of your previous lecture. Mechanical, physical, chemical and biological. Mechanical it's ligation, vascular suture and prosthetics of the vessel. Physical cold, cauterization and laser. Chemical methods, vasoconstrictors and uh, compounds that increase blood clotting. Mechanical antisepsis. Uh, it is mechanical elimination microorganism from the wound. This type of antisepsis contains three parts. To the, to the wound, primary debridement and secondary debridement. To the, to the wound, include mechanical elimination trash from the wound. When we provide this step of cleaning, we use antiseptics. So, if we want to be precise in definitions, to the, to the wound is a part of mixed antiseptics. Primary debridement includes the elimination of blood clots, excision of the non viable wound walls. During this part of mechanical antiseptics, we can drain it. In, uh, put drain into the wound if we need to do so. Drainage is part of physical antisepsis, so we will discuss this further. Secondary debridement. It includes excision of the necrotized wound wall, elimination of pus from the uh, purulent contains from the wound. So we can say that this type of mechanical antisepsis is directed by infection complaints of the wound. In this case, we often use the drain to prevent further infection because the closed wound is the optimal environment for the microorganism's growth. And here we see keloid scar. In the case of um, severe surgical wound infection. Uh, I ho hope you didn't see this, because somebody uh, can think this is a malpractice and this is this person need uh, a surgery to incise this scar. So thank you for uh, your attention. I think you can learn somebody uh, some, something sorry from this lecture. So thank you.